and welcome to this webinar on small <coughs> sorry small and very small scale robotics for mining the this webinar is organized by the robo miners project my name is claudio rossi and i'm a, i am the coordinator of the project and a few words about robo miners to start with uh, robo miners is a eu funded project which responds to the eu call for new solution for sustainable production of raw materials and our vision is to bring the digital revolution to the raw material sector and our aim is to contribute to transform the mining industry into a high-tech industry so the aim of today's webinar is to provide an overview of the potential of robotics technology applied to mining and we will focus on the potential uh, mining sites and deposits right uh, we will have four presentations with an overview of abandoned mine and other potential sites in, in Europe, on the challenges of uh, reopening a closed mine, on the steps needed from the identification of a deposit uh, until the opening of the mine, and then <clears throat> finally on the contribution of robo miners technology uh, to the sector, which includes not only robotics, but only uh, but also selective mining tools, which means basically ore perception and production tools. And this also involves rethinking several aspects of the whole mining system and the whole mining ecosystem. So there's several technological aspects involved. Um, I will introduce the speakers one by one before the presentation. After each presentation, there will be a Q&A session where uh, the, the attendees can ask, ask questions using the, the panel, the Q&A panel to the, to the panelists and we'll have 10 to 15 minutes a q a session without any further delay i will introduce you the first speaker who is professor eva artai eva is a geologist she's an a honorary professor at the miskot university in hungary her research area is ore geology and mineral resources she has more than 40 years in of teaching experience leading courses in physical geology environmental geology and mineral deposits and has taken part in several EU and uh, national research projects. She has more than 80 scientific, pub scientific publications, and she has been editor-in-chief of the European Geologist Journal and coordinator of the EFG panel of experts education. So Eva will talk about potential targets of small-scale robot mining. So Eva, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. Claudio. Our university, University of Miskolc, is responsible for the geological and mining background of, uh, of the Rubo Miners project. And uh, <coughs> uh, the title you, you, Claudio, didn't mention the complete title, Resilient Bio-Inspired Modular Robotic Miners, Maybe the bio inspiration is uh, the most innovative part of this project. Uh, the project started in 2019 in June and originally it was planned to be a four year long project, but because of the working difficulties due to the pandemic, we asked for a six month extension. We have 14 partners from 11 countries. Uh, Plus, one of the partners, the European Federation of Geologists, brought in its national member associations, uh, which cover 17 countries and contributed to the data collection. Uh, the basic objective of the project is to reduce the EU's import dependency of strate strategic raw materials uh, and have the EU to, to get these resources, uh, get these materials from domestic resources. How is it possible? By the exploitation of mineral deposits, which are not economic by traditional mining because they are too small, too deep or difficult to access. Uh, for this reason, the consortium develops a uh, modular reconfigurable robot miner, which is capable of uh, 
selective mining underground in a flooded environment. These are the specific objectives to construct a robot prototype, validate the key functions, design the mining ecosystem, and study and advance future research challenges related to the capabilities of the project. Uh, the concept is that the robot in parts, in modules, would be sent down to the deposit uh, through a large diameter borehole. And uh, from this part, the robot would assemble itself. It will be equipped uh, with specific sensors, so it will be able to detect the ore, uh, metal enrichments and follow the ore. And it will produce slurry. The slurry is pumped out and processed on surface. So this, this is shortly about the project itself. As, and uh, uh, as for the uh, geological uh, background, we started the work with the review of the uh, mineral deposits, deposits which can be relevant for the mining. We described and characterized these deposits. And in the frame of the working group session in which the advisory board members were also involved, we ranked these deposits. The ranking was based on these parameters listed here. And uh, each parameter could have a maximum of five points. And uh, it turned out that the sediment hosted stratiform copper mineralizations, the so called kufre schiffer type mineralizations, are the best targets. Why? Because they are extensive two dimensionally, they are relatively thin easy to identify and easy to follow. For similar reasons, the vein type mineralizations are also good targets. Here the problem can be that the veins in general are vertical or subvertical, so the robot should be able uh, to move vertically. Uh, we also built up a database. Uh, the EFGs linked to parties collected data from 17 countries uh, on former uh, abandoned mining sites. They collected historical data, the geotechnical conditions, deposit site, a, a lot of kinds of data. It may be surprising or impressive that from these 17 countries, which are indicated here, from these 17 countries, 1,548 sites were identified, identified which are potential targets. So these data will be visualized and uh, it will be available, accessible through the project website through an um, interactive platform from July this year. So you, if you are interested, you can visit the website. We also set up mining scenarios, mining scenarios in which the robot can work. Uh, three mining scenarios were defined. First, abandoned mines, and also operating mines with known unfeasible sections. Uh, second is the ultra depths. What do we mean by ultra depths? We should think in terms of Europe, so as in Europe, the deepest mine, Pihasam in Finland, is almost 1,500 meters deep. Below these depths, we consider the ultra depths. And the third scenario is the small deposits, which can be good enrichment, uh, but uneconomic for traditional mining because they are too small. Uh, in the following, I would like to provide a short outlook on potential targets in Europe. Uh, I arranged these sites in the main metallogenic belts, which overlap with the main tectonic units. 
these are the East, East European Kraton. Uh, we will focus on the Fenescandian shield part of it. Uh, the Caledonian belt, which includes uh, Western Scandinavia and the British Isles, the Variscan range, Iberian pyrite belt from France to Poland, also including South East England, and the Alpine range, Alpine belt, which includes the Alps, Carpathians, Balkans, Dinarids, and Apennines. As for this European Craton, you can see that we have a lot of examples, a lot of mineral deposits we have here, and a lot of examples for abundant mines and also operating mines with unfeasible sections. I would mention first the Skalefte and Bergslagen regions, maybe also Piha Somi from Finland, uh, for the base metal mineralizations and, and also the precious metal mineralization. And uh, as for the precious metal, we have to mention in Lapland Kitila, which is the largest gold mine in the European Union. And also mention uh, Nor the Norbotten and the Bergslagen regions for the rare earth element potential uh, in the uh, in the um, alkaline magmatites, and also Autokumpu here, which again, base metal and nickel chromium precious metal mineralization. Finally, the chemi deposit is mentioned here because this is the only operating chromium mine in the European Union. I, wouldn't consider Albania, no, only the European Union. And this can be also a scenario for the Artro Deep because uh, this, this is a layered chromite deposit and the layers slightly dipping and they were identified by geophysical methods at the depths of 2.5 kilometers. Uh, next belt is the Caledronites. Uh, Scandinavian part first, you see that there are a lot of base metal and precious metal deposits, but other kind of mineralizations. Uh, as for the abandoned mines, I would mention only the Konsberg Silver District. Uh, it's a historical mining region because mining activity lasted for more than 300 years here, and still we have 80 identified old mining sites. Uh, here at Vilinzi Zone, we can also find an example for the outer depths uh, with the alum shale. This alum shale is a bituminous shale, which was mined as a uranium ore, containing other important strategic elements. And uh, uh, it is, close to surface in the northern part of Scandinavia and deep, dipping southward and in southern Sweden and Denmark, it was identified by uh, petroleum exploration drill holes at a depth of seven kilometers. Finally, the fan complex in the Oslo Graben, uh, again for the rare earth element elements potential, first of all, but with other metals. Uh, this area is only explored, mining hasn't started here. Still in the Caledonites, uh, in the British Isles, Ireland has a larger importance with abandoned mines and operating mines. Here uh, you can see the larger deposits, uh, the Tara mine, maybe the largest one here in Navan. And uh, uh, these are mostly vein type mineralization with zinc, uh, lead, silver. Uh, so both abundant and operating mines, a lot, a lot. Uh, from Scotland, uh, Scotland uh, I would mention only one site, this is Tindrum, uh, 
it may be interesting for us because it is uh, the reopening of an old mine uh, at quite a small scale and the uh, gold and silver is mined here. Going to the next belt, Bariskan belt. Let's see first the Iberian Peninsula and I would focus on the Iberian pirate belt here, which stretches more than 200 kilometers and the width is 700 ki uh, uh, 70 kilometers, uh, mostly volcanic massive sulfide type deposits. It has a long mining history as mining goes back to 8th century BC or even uh, older. Uh, copper is the dominant uh, metal, but also other metals, including precious metals, uh, were mined. Mm, and it, the area still has a very good potential here. A few important mining sites are indicated. Uh, still in the Varis Combat, uh, beside Iberia, uh, there are several uh, examples uh, for uh, abandoned mines and also small deposits. Uh, if we start from here, from Cornwall, Cornwall was famous for the tin mines, both tin and copper mines, but also mining, producing other metals. And again, a very long mining history, which goes back to 2000 BC. Uh, this is a grazing type mineralization, and we can find a similar type of mineralization here in the Erzgebirge or Old Mountains, which, uh, which can be found uh, along the border between the Czech Republic and Germany. Uh, grazing type mineralization, as I mentioned, and uh, with tin, silver, lithium, tungsten, uranium hundreds of years of mining activity. And lately, not long ago, it was pointed out that at Chinovec, uh, which is the Czech part, in the Czech part, uh, the largest lithium reserves of the European Union were found. Uh, there are lots of lots of abandoned mines in this belt. Uh, I would mention only one, Rammersberg in Germany, uh, which acts now as a museum mine. And uh, here in this Variscan zone, we can find the best example for the ultra deep scenario with the Kufer Schiefer formation, which can be followed from England to Silesia, Poland. Basically, it's a copper ore, but contains a lot of other metals. And while, for example, in Germany, it is near surface, in southern Poland, Silesia, it can be, it was identified by drill holes at a depth of two kilometers. So an excellent example for the ultra deep scenario. Finally, we arrived at the alpine zone, alpine belt. From the Alps, uh, I would mention the orogenic gold uh, deposits, which can be considered as examples for um, abundant mines. But I should also mention Mitterzeel as, as an operating mine because it's a world class uh, deposit, works as tungsten deposit, also producing uh, other metals. Here in, uh, here in uh, Slovenia, we find uh, the, again, uh, a world class mercury uh, deposit at Idria, which was closed. The mining was seized not long ago. If we go towards the Carpathians. In the Carpathian zone, there are numerous abundant mines because in this area, uh, the precious metal, the mining of gold and silver 
uh, was very active in uh, the Middle Ages. So we have a lot of abundant mines in this area from the Middle Ages. I would mention only one, uh, Russia Montana, uh, not only uh, because it, the mining activity goes back to the Roman times here, but also for the long lasting debate on the potential opening a mine here. So finally, it was in 2015 that the Romanian parliament decided uh, that the, the mining activity is not allowed in this area. Uh, if we go a little bit uh, south, the Balkan Peninsula, you see the large variety of deposit types here, examples for abandoned mines and also operating mines with unfeasible sections. I mention only one, Chilopec, in uh, the western part of Bulgaria because it's a significant uh, copper and gold producer. And from Albania, I would mention the platinum group element bearing uh, polyform chromite. So finally, uh, you could see that the potential is here in Europe. And there are a lot of mineral deposits which could be exploited uh, by the Robo miners technology. Let's hope that it will be realized in the close future. Thank you for your attention. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Eva. Very interesting uh, presentation. I see that there's a, a, a lot of potential, a very, a very high number of sites, and this is the beginning of the project. So I'm sure that we will, we will discover more as we, we go on with the, with the investigation. So um, I just want to um, mention to the attendees that this was just uh, the first presentation of the four. And we will go from the more generic to the more specific, uh, to more specific uh, uh, topics. It's time now for uh, taking some questions from the audience. Let's see. One second. I made some mistake. Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, the first question for Eva is, why do you think that unfeasible section of existing mines would become feasible to exploit uh, to exploit using this technology? Mm, I, I think that it would be a mutually benefiting activity. I mean, if we have a working mine, uh, the infrastructure is already there. The tunnels are already there. So uh, it, it would be a good base for uh, establish a, a robo miner site there. And why is it good for the traditional mining? Because uh, in a deposit, uh, there can be parts which can be exploited economically by these huge mining machines. But there can be sections, for example, small veins or smaller lenses for which it is not worse to, to form huge cavities by these huge, huge machines. So this is where the robo miner can act and as I mentioned, it would be a mutual benefit. Thank you. Oops. Thank you, Eva. Uh, I have another question. <clears throat> uh, it's a bit long. <laughs> the larger Irish lead zinc deposits of economic interest for the last 60 Excuse years. Excuse me, would you, because I, I couldn't listen the, the beginning. Yeah, sorry. So uh, one, one question is the larger Irish lead zinc deposits of economic interest for the last 60 years are strata bound deposits rather than vein type deposits. The robo miners technology can also be applied to strata bound deposits, right? 
Yes, exactly. So uh, vein lag deposits uh, are one of the best options because it, it is, uh, the ore is concentrated in veins. But straight to bone deposits can also be exploited by this technology. Thank you. One more question. Cooper Schiffer type was identified as one of the target types. Does the project have any industrial partners working on this type of, type of deposits? Uh, not yet, uh, but yes, our aim to, to approach them because we also have a, a partner in the consortium from Poland and uh, this partner could be a link to the mining company. Mm -hmm. Yes, if I may add something is, this project is a, is a, um, it's a research project, so we don't aim to, to, to reach industrial maturity in the, framework of the, uh, in the framework of the project. But towards the end of the, of the project, we will certainly contact a relevant industry. Okay, so we have time for another question. Um, can you briefly mention which are the critical mi minerals identified by the EU? There's a list of critical materials. Yes. And can, uh, in, the, in the list of deposits that, that you just uh, showed, can we find these materials? And which ones? Of course. Uh, so there was, uh, my time was very limited. So you probably realize that I mentioned only a few matters. So I, it would take too long if I, if I list all, all the critical matters and which mm -hmm. one can be in which deposit and which site. But of course, the, mm -hmm. the critical elements would be, would be targets of this technology. Yes, because I, I would like to, to mention that apart from the economic value, of course, which is the main driver, there are also uh, strategic reasons. So we might uh, mine in Europe some mineral, even if it is not for economic reasons, but for political or strategical reasons, for not depending from other or external countries. So just my comment. I don't know if it is, it makes sense. <clears throat> okay, our next speaker is uh, Jose Mario Castello Branco. Josa is a, an exploration geologist with over 30 years of international experience in mineral exploration and project management in Portugal, Spain, and Romania. He was actively involved in the assessment of new exploration opportunities uh, and new business development and participated in the exploration discovery of gold deposits in Portugal, as well as metal-based VH, VHMS deposits in Spain and Portugal. Jose now leads new business development and technical support processes for a consulting firm specializing in mineral exploration, including business facilitation and engineering, engineering geology. And Jose will speak about the challenges of reopening an old mine. Jose, whenever you're ready. Hello, good afternoon. Thanks, thanks, thanks for the invitation, first of all. Uh, I would like, first of all, to, to, to thank the invitation from RoboMimes and in particular to Vitor who addressed, addressed this, this uh, uh, invitation. And uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'll try my best to, to get you uh, uh, a general overview instead, instead of a general overview of a series of, of, of opportunities. Uh, I'll try to give a, a general overview of a particular opportunity. And the, this opportunity is uh, the, the Jules mine, which is uh, located, sorry, let me get back, yeah, uh, which is located in the uh, northern part of Portugal and uh, situated in, in, in one of these little tectonic provinces called uh, the Central Iberian Zone, which basically, in, in rough terms, in the northern part includes a sequence of, of uh, low, low, low order of vision up to, well, uh, the Vodian sequence, which over trusts uh, uh, another sequence, which comprises of a, a turbidite sequence, 
uh, of the, the late, late precambrian to the lower, lower cambrian. The old sequence is intruded extensively by Ercinian granites, either, either syntectonic metamorphic granites to extensional uh, I type uh, granites, which occur throughout most of this wealth. Uh, the Charles Mines is adjacent to one of these major suture. I don't know, I'm not sure if you can, can all see my, my pointer, uh, but a, a suture zone where the mine, mine, uh, the mine is located, which is the regular green fault, uh, 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 which is also a, a major, well, deep seated, crucial scale structure uh, of which. The relationship with mineralizations, gold mineralizations in the area is, is, is not clear, but suspected. Uh, the gels, let, let us go into more detail on, on the gels mine area. And as I said, I said before, the, the area is dominated by, well, granite, syntectonic, two mica batalites in the, in the central area. And on the left-hand side, post-tectonic granites. And uh, these rocks have been intruded into a sequence of, well, lower Paleozoic to Precambrian and upper Paleozoic, to, up, well, starting from Silurian up to younger, younger formations to the north, northeast. Uh, in the area, this area, the area I'm talking about, which is the Jarl's mine area, uh, it's integrated into, in a, in a, a regional, gold district that has got the most significant uh, gold uh, mineral deposits in, 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 in Portugal, as far as I'm aware. Uh, the Jobs mine has been the only mine producing in, in the old Iberia in the early 90s, uh, in, in the early, sorry, in the middle 80s. Uh, afterwards, uh, they, the, there was also this, this mine from Rio Tinto, which was exploited at Gossard, not hard rock, but in, in, in Spain. But other than that, that this was the old, only producing mine in Portugal for 60 years, almost 59 to be exact. Uh, and uh, the curious thing was that all the gold produced there would go uh, directly into the, 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 the state's uh, boxes. Huh? <laughs> uh, there was a kind of a, a compromise that all production would go for the, the coin industry in, in the treasure, basically. So uh, the the Jones mine is adjacent to another shear zone, which is another project which could be of interest in the future because it's a virgin deposit, uh, and this will be subject to a public tender process. So th there will be a future in this. And the old mine, Roman mine area, which is the Tres Minas area, that represents from from our perspective. The, the biggest hard rock Roman mining uh, in, in the old of Portugal. And uh, well, there are several calculations, but um, depends on, on, the, on the morphology of the paleo topography uh, can be modeled, but something like between 30 and 50 million tons of rock, mineralized rock have been exploited in Tres Minas. The Jaulas, Jalus mine, which I will be talking about, has also been uh, exploited by the Romans. And uh, the curious thing was that uh, they, they managed to have works to depths of up to 1500, uh, 150 meters. And they managed to, and, and that, uh, that accounts for more or less 100 meters below, below the water, or the, the then water table. So it means that they're pumping capabilities were fantastic. Uh, and let us talk about the, re the most recent challenge uh, mine, some, some, some key figures. Uh, this was a very, very, very small mine, very, very artisanal, artisanal mining for the, the actual, uh, for the present days, a lot of hand marking, but there was some, 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 some occasional, uh, Mechanization, but most of the, the, the mine the story of mine was, was, was very, very artisanal. The gold production was, well, 
Uh, there were periods where they were able to produce about one kilogram of gold per day, but the average was uh, 60, 60, 600 grams daily. Silver production, more or less four times the amount of, 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 uh, of gold. And then they were able to produce a concentrate of, of uh, well, relatively small concentrate of uh, uh, 1,300 tons a, a year. The typical, the, the mining method was the typical cut and fill. And uh, hydraulic fill has been used uh, until, until, until the, uh, the beginning of the, the years 80s, the eight, uh, 1980. Uh, the dominant, uh, dominantly, they were just filled with, with a rough material. And, and uh, in the 80s, they introduced hydraulic fill. Uh, of some of the stones, so part of the, the, the at least the, the some of the stones are, are filled with hydraulic hydraulic field, which could theoretically be remined because it's it's just compactated hydraulic field. Uh, the mine is is relatively deep for an old uh, for for a, uh, an old, old, old an old mine. It has got sixteen levels. Which accounts well, average for 620 meters below surface, and the th thing is that even being small, uh, the mine managed to produce something like well 800 804,000 ounces. Uh, it's a reference. Uh, probably the right figure, not official, would be close to one million ounces. Which is rather respectful for for a small a small mine. The thing is that they 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 mined all this this uh, this gold uh, during sixty years, uh, nearly sixty years. So, as I said, Roman workings down to one hundred and thirty meters, exceptionally one hundred and fifty meters depth, and the mine now is flooded. This is the general view of the mine area. Part of the the tailings. The tailing stamp is, has been already uh, uh, rebuilt, reconstructed, uh, re reformed, and uh, uh, these most of these areas will be the areas of the old, you know, the, well, the miners, the offices, and the thing is the residences. So the the Campo vein, which is the main vein, this this structure is uh, the, the Jalous vein is basically made up of a series of anastomosing veins, but there is a consistent one, which they call the Campo vein, that extends for, well, I, here I'm showing a section of something like uh, one, well, 600 meters or so, uh, but this vein extends for at least five, five kilometers along strike to, to the south, southeast. This is another vein that has been found uh, early in the, in the 70s and has been mined. They called it the Juvio, so they call it split. They call it, they, they literally it means split vein. And all this has been mined until 1992. That's when the mine stopped. And why did mine close? Well, I think I've got in bold the main, main prices, local prices. And uh, 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 and also, that's that's a market reason, and the scattering of the ore shoots at depth it's it's a geological uh, as well as, as, a, as a geological reason. Why? Because uh, the ore shoots seem to be consist more consistent in, at, in the shallower depths, and they tend to be, as I will show you later, uh, they be more scattered at depth. Although the grades continue, and uh, there are no 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 evidences. From until the, the, the known depths that have been uh, investigated, which is something like 700 meters with drilling included, the vein still remains. So it's one of these mesothermal veins that uh, well, will, will, will go down, down into the, the granite and dip, and, and uh, there are no reasons to think that uh, it, 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 it's, it's, it's closing down. Huh? So the, the other reasons would be extraction in many phases simultaneously because of the scattering of the ore shoots. And uh, well, and that also causes other types of problems, bottlenecking or knowledge and transport costs. Uh, 
the attempts of that of mechanization brought also another problem which was the great dilution so if you want to mechanize you have to dilute and in the end uh, the costs in pay so little mechanization on the other side and of course from 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 the beginning until recently the the, the increase of labor costs for such a, an artisanal mining in uh, were unbearable. So this is this gives you an idea on, on the time of the life on life uh, life cycle of the, of the gold mine. So during this period from from the opening until uh, let us say early 70s was pretty stable. No surprises, although low was no no surprises. And that that's what we're getting is these these uh, these highs and downs and highs and downs. And and uh, unfortunately during this down with accumulated downs con, con, uh, alternating with ups uh, in this last down that's where what the mine uh, eventually closed so it, this this mine as i said is closed since 1992 so this is an idea I give you some, well this uh, in, in 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 the right right below you you see the the, the, the this Sloping the the, 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 cut and, the the mining method, which is the cut and field sloping, uh, and uh, up here, uh, what's what's shown is 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 the distribution of the ore shoots. As you see, they are more consistent in the upper part, so they show some inconsistency, and well, they get a bit scattered. Although the Roman workings were more concentrated in this area, so they must have had some kind of supergene super enrichment or something or other that uh, explains that they had, that, that, that's the reason why they had better developed here. But uh, the most recent uh, mining works were concentrated in, in the northern part of the mine. So you see in, in pink, it's the granite uh, contact with, with the, 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 the pale, lower Paleozoic, uh, upper Precambrian uh, meta sediments. Uh, the problems in the end of the mine were really the lower levels, as you see here. They were, as I said, scattered. So the more they were having problems here on continuity, uh, they were getting too dispersed, uh, uh, trying to exploit the upper parts and uh, also the other parallel vein. And that, that's the reason, one of the main reasons why, why first of all, uh, they stop the mine. Second, uh, maybe it's time for us to start, to, to start thinking on uh, a different approach. And another different approach uh, could be rubber mining. Huh? Uh, a, small, a small description on the vein. So this is really a discrete vein. Uh, average, it's incredible how, 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 how continuous uh, uh, a structure like this which is only 25 centimeters wide can be, and uh, grades well, averaging 20 grams per ton in the early days, probably 30 or 40. Uh, uh, the, using using this mine because that's the reason why they were they were going into into very artisanal mining is that they were trying to minimize the. the the dilution because the host rock of the vein is literally barren so you can you can you can get you can get get no contribution from from the host rock no altera alteration well there is a suicide alteration but uh, it's it's not a uh, gold bearing so so feed grade so this this gets our dilution to five grams per ton and the mine was able to produce about 180 tons a, a day of ore uh, with this, this feed grades, I repeated it here, sorry. Uh, and uh, based on, on the, the, well, yesterday's, or the day before yesterday's prices, the institute value of the ore was about 288.5 uh, US dollars per ton. So let us assume a possibility. I called it Robomine. Uh, I, I, I like I like this toy here uh, to represent the, the, the robot mine because I, I, I'm not sure part of, part of, of the audience 
hasn't seen this thing because this this was one of the first first uh, video games that I've used when there were only only very few computers available. But that's the Pac-Man, and I think the image of the Pac-Man here uh, could be uh, could be applicable <laughs> to some extent. And let us think that we have uh, a face of 0.5 meters wide. And, and, and that the, our Pac-Man, our Robo, our Robo Miner, is capable of extracting a face of 25 by 25. Let us assume we had three to five Robo units down, down underground. And uh, with that, hopefully we do something like 100 meters, a long strike in total with three, three, that would produce something like 15 tons of ore with a feed grade of 20 grams per ton. With only a miserable amount of 50, 15 tons, we will have, uh, in, 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 uh, we'd, we'd have a, a, well, uh, a four times uh, added value to the ore you would be extracting. So let us take uh, one of the deepest portions, which I find that it's the last, the least, the least mined area. There's a lot of gaps, uh, open, open spaces that have been uh, have, have not been mined. And there we can think about selective mining, highly selective mining, and that's what 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 I think the Robo miner is made for. So you would be not losing time uh, and money. Uh, and, 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 and being selective, we could, we, could, we could use, well, let us say, this is a, an example of, of, of how the operation would, would, would do. You can always think, well, that there are details that would need to be um, uh, dealt with, especially if you would progress from, from, from the bottom to the top, from, if from the top to the bottom using such, such a machine. That would need to be uh, uh, clarified, but uh, the idea is that uh, okay. Let us assume you would you would mine a face of twenty five by twenty five meters, and here we are talking about small scale mining, really. And uh, this block would be in the order of six hundred meters, then hundred uh, meters by 0.5, You would represent this would represent. Uh, 42,000 tons. Let us assume that 30% of this would be payable. Is uh, would equate to, well, this amount of tons of ore, this amount of, of, of grams of, of, of contained gold, so 8,000 8, ounces up to 10, and, and an in situ value of 14.54 uh, million uh, US dollars. So, and uh, I think I think this this opportunity at least needs need uh, the, this mine needs to be equated in terms of of uh, well, a rehabilitation of, of part of the, the, the old workings and and uh, the robo mine would be a possibility to my view. So the opportunities of the, of, of, of this approach would be well the area is relatively sensitive so low environmental and social impact, no need for dewatering, reduced treatment costs, will, uh, will be, of course, a light infrastructure, improved selectivity, low mining costs, of course, and labor costs, well, 15 people, I don't know, versus 500 people when mine was active. And, and the stopping faces, if you can call them as such, would be well minute mining selectivity well uh, apparently the mine has got a good record of, of all the, the the existing stops so the first approach would be to recollect all that data that is available and and and, and feed it in, into a navigated system which would well automatically or, or semi-automatically would be able to uh, find their way through the ore shoots well in this panel or another panel that we might define. 
And thank you for, for your attention. I think I've finished my presentation. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Jose. Very nice presentation. I also played Pac-Man, so I appreciated the, the metaphor, the image. <laughs> yeah, so yes, okay. So uh, there was no copies between the two, the, those two. <laughs> okay, so it's time now for the question and answers. Uh, let me remind to the attendees that you can put your questions on the Q&A panel. I have selected a few of them, so let's break the ice. Um, Jose, you mentioned cut and fill stopping. Does this mean that ore from deeper levels has already been extracted and these levels are no longer accessible? No, it doesn't mean that. No, no, no. Because uh, the, the, the open, the most, most of the back, um, backfill material is concentrated in other areas than the, uh, the area I've showed the ore run. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so in other words, uh, it's accessible. Most of the mine is accessible. Uh, the the cut and field stopping, it's the most recent one, and it represents a smaller part of the the, the, the mining mining of the, the mining history of of of, of, Jorge, of the Jorge mine. Okay. Did I answer to your, to your question? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Another yeah. another question and. Is the jasmine flooded or partially flooded? And it is. To which level? Yeah, it is. It is flooded uh, from from well, theoretically from the third, second to the third. It, it varies a bit uh, with uh, with uh, the along the year, but uh, between the second and third third uh, mine level. Mm -hmm. So, in other words. Uh, let us say 90 meters, between 160 meters and 50 meters. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> it's, it's so. In other words, in 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 terms of a potential exploitation, it would be totally underwater. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, next question: uh, Is the hydraulic field stable, or did they use cement? Or can it cause stability problems in lower levels? In general, no problems. Uh, there, there were some stability problems in the southern parts of the mine, but not in these areas that we've been considering. No, there was pretty, pretty, pretty ge geotechnically relatively uh, sound and safe. Huh? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. No, 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 no big issues. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question. Uh, you mentioned the ore shots are scatter, scattering with depth. This means that you have many quartz veins, smaller in size and dispersed in the gran granite? Well, uh, so the quartz veins don't, don't change much. What, uh, what changes is deposition of sulfides. There, well, there are less sulfide material in the quartz veins. Uh, well, alternating well, they are still low, so well as as, as 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 in the map is shown, as it's shown in the map, the the the, the grades are still there, but you you can see the ore shoots. Well, apparently in the, in the northern part, that's well what we know. The, the they they seem to be a bit more scattered. That's why more selective mining would help too, because they left behind a lot of that mineralized material because of that. They couldn't be. To working well, the mine, mine people had problems to be working simultaneously in many fronts because these shoots were, were relatively slow, small. A question for Jose is re related to the mining status. Are flooded or, or it is possible to be filled with water? Understanding that's much more effective to use those robots to work and send the slurry on the surface. Sorry, so I, I didn't understand the first the first yeah. sentence. Yeah, I mean the is first part of the sentence. Sorry. The first part of the sentence is, is is the mind flooded? I mean, is it about the mind? Yeah, the answer is yes. Yeah. Yeah, we yeah. already answered that. Uh, because uh, I the, the understand there's the understanding that that's much more effective to use robots to work and send the slurry to surface. So I can answer that. Yeah, yeah, effectively, effectively, yes. effectively yeah. this is one of the of the 
or the, of the advantages of, yeah the advantage of the ideas that we have with global miners to yes, produce yes. as larry actually to turn to turn a problem water into into something uh, useful to to bring it to surface the 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 ore via slurry very good question La one last question just arrived do you think that uh, the rov is able to explore the exploitation levels beyond sh shaft number eight this is very specific <laughs> okay let me put you to Okay. Uh, yeah. uh, number eight, shaft number eight is one of these. Mm -hmm. Can you see? Yeah. Yeah. So the question is why? Why? Yeah. Yes. Yes. You can access from here, which is the main main extraction shaft, the Santa Barbara shaft, and from Santa Barbara shaft you can access the any parts of of the deposit. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Although these ones don't go that further, but uh, you have a still the, the, the Santa Barbara shaft, which goes down to the 16th level. The, 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 the 13th, well, 16th level, yes. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much, jo Jose. I think we can stop here. Anyway, if there are more questions, okay. uh, we can answer uh, towards the end of the of the of the four presentations. There will be some times. Okay. If we skip the pace, we, there will be some time for a final, uh, final round of, of questions. So let's move on to Edmund Seitz. So next presentation is uh, by Ed, Edmund Seitz. Uh, he's a research geologist who graduated in geology and have obtained a master and PhD degrees in mineral exploitation, exploration, sorry. <clears throat> he has a 40 years long career working in the mining industry as an exploration geologist first, and then as a, as a research geologist and consultant. He has also worked uh, in education and training. Since 2018, he has been the secretary of the Pan-European Reserves and Resources Reporting Committee, PERC, and second representative of the Committee for Mineral Reserves International Reporting Standards. <clears throat> Ed will talk about the steps from the discovery of, the, of a deposit until the, the opening of a mine. So thank you, Ed, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, well, yeah, as, as uh, Claudia has already said, I'm a, well, I'm actually a resource geologist rather than a research geologist, but, uh, uh, and he's also uh, introduced the fact that I've been a secretary of PERC at the moment. Uh, for the first half of my career, I worked mainly with uh, mining companies, but in recent years, I've been working as a consultant in the aspect of uh, resource geology and ore reserves. Uh, the photograph I'm showing on this slide was taken about five years ago, and it's of the Corta Atalaya open pit mine at Minas de Rio Tinto in Spain. I actually worked there in the 1980s when that pit was still active. And in addition to what you see in the flooded open pit, there used to be an underground mine in to the right of where you're looking and sort of more or less under the feet, my feet where I'm standing. Uh, and that was possible to access from the open pit. Uh, before the open pit ceased mining. So again, it would, you know, would potentially be an area that could be looked at for robot miner. But uh, I, I just also want to remind you that the, the very brown color of the water there reflects its very acidic nature, which is going to be another thing that the uh, robot miners may have to uh, cope with in deposits like this, which were mining uh, massive sulfide uh, ore, which uh, is uh, contains a lot of pyrite, which when it oxidizes generates very acidic uh, mine water, uh, but I'm sure that's been taken into account. I should also just, just point out, I, I've only become familiar with this project since uh, being asked to present at it, so I'm finding it very interesting to learn the ideas of what they're, they're doing. <coughs> uh, so in, in today's talk, I'm just going to give a quick overview of the steps involved uh, uh, in taking, well, developing a, a mineral project from concept through evaluation to uh, the construction of a mine, then the operation of the mine, and finally its closure. And uh, obviously, as uh, covered in Jose's uh, talk, you know, you, you may continue this whole cycle again if you go back to an old mining area, which we call a brownfield site, and start again with a new concept uh, to develop it or to redevelop it as a, an active mine again. Uh, 
Uh, before going on to the main, main part of the talk, I'm going to introduce some terms that we typically use in developing uh, new mining projects, which may not be familiar to a lot of people. Uh, but just uh, firstly, there's this uh, another slide of mining activity at Rio Tinto in Spain, which I thought might be of interest. And in fact, it's quite interesting that Jose Castello referred to the Romans having a mine below the water table. Uh, this photograph shows an example of a Roman water wheel, which was discovered at the start of the modern mining area uh, era in Rio Tinto in 1919, about 100 years ago. And those Roman mines were very small scale underground mines, and they were probably using, you know, slave labor more or less, where the, the workers were working underground in very narrow spaces. Uh, then in the start of the 20th century in 1919, they were developing open pit mines with large teams of workers and the materials being moved by rail. And that was still very labor intensive, as you can see from the number of people in the photograph. And then in more recent years, open pit mining was uh, continued at Rio Tinto in the 1970s onwards. And it was extracting lower grade ores with large scale mechanized mining equipment. And obviously the Robo Miners project is looking at generating, you know, yet another generation of technologies that might mine smaller, high-grade ores on a more selective basis. I uh, should just note that the mining activity at Minas de Rio Tinto it ceased again in 2001, but then it was restarted in 2016 as an open pit mine, which is currently operated by Atalaya Mining. Uh, so next, next I've got on some of the terminology that's used in the concept project development. Uh, on this slide, I'm introducing two organizations that are important uh, in terms of uh, mineral resource and reserve reporting. There's CRISCO, which is the Committee for Mineral Reserves International Reporting Standards. It's a grouping of 14 national and regional organizations which are responsible for the codes and standards used for public reporting. But companies with mineral assets. And in countries such as uh, Canada and, and Australia, uh, compliance with those codes and standards is a requirement of the government legislation and the stock exchange regulations for publicly listed companies. Uh, PERC, which is the sort of European uh, grouping in that, or the, which is the Pan-European Resource and Reserve Reporting Committee. It's a grouping of six Europe-based professional organizations, including the EFG, which is responsible for developing and maintaining the PERC reporting standard, which is the, the one that we uh, have for, for Europe. And all, an important thing underlying all of this is that all the CRISCO members, all, all these 14 organizations have agreed on common definitions of 16 key terms and some of those I'll be introducing on the next few slides which are terms such as mineral resources, mineral reserves, feasibility study. Uh, this slide shows the framework which underpins these definitions that I've referred to. The, the left hand column of this figure shows the, the mineral resources uh, categories which represent mineralization in the ground that could potentially be extracted economically. Uh, from the top to the bottom, you have uh, inf inferred, indicated, measured. That indicates an increase in geological knowledge and a reduction in the uncertainties associated with the estimates as, as you move downwards on this uh, figure. Uh, the, on the right hand side, we have uh, mineral reserves categories, which represent the material that can actually be extracted economically. And converting mineral resources to mineral reserves requires consideration of what we refer to as the modifying factors, which are listed down at the bottom. <clears throat> These are factors that affect the technical and economic feasibility of extracting material from the ground and including the mining, processing, metallurgical and other factors. Uh, and that would, for instance, what um, in the last talk, what we heard about mining selectivity would obviously be one of those because when you move from the mineral resources to mineral reserves, you have to often take some waste rock as well, extracts of waste rock as well, and that you, know, you want to minimize the amount of waste rock that you have to take when you're extracting material. Uh, what you should also note, the footnote at the bottom, 
that's a requirement to complete a study to at least a pre-feasibility level in order to be able to publicly report middle reserves. And the, the rest of the talk is going to explain a little bit about you know, what elements go into a pre-feasibility study and the definition of the different study types recognized by CRISCO. Uh, so these are the three types of technical study which have been defined by CRISCO and incorporated into the PERC standard. We have a scoping study, that's an order of magnitude study, which is often referred to as a preliminary economic assessment or PEA. Secondly, we have a, a pre-feasibility study, uh, which is uh, abbreviated to PFS, which is a comprehensive study of a range of options for the development of a project. And that may involve completion of trade-off studies between alternative extraction methods. For instance, you, you know, you might be, uh, traded off, could we use a new technology as robot mining in this area versus traditional extraction? And what would be the differences in costs and so forth along the lines that uh, was given in the, the, ex the last example. And then a feasibility study is a comprehensive study of the selected development option. This is where the design is developed in more detail and more accurate geological models and cost estimates are obtained. And the overall objective at this point is to try to identify key risk factors and take steps to manage those so that you eliminate or minimize their potential impacts on the project and try and avoid any surprises happening during the development of the project. And this, this slide summarizes those study types in a nice graphical sort of manner. At, at a scoping study, you're, you're looking at lots of different possibilities and trying to answer the question, what could it be? And then at pre-feasibility, you've got a couple of, you know, realistic scenarios available and you're saying, what should it be? And then at the feasibility study, you've picked one particular option and you're trying to fine tune, if you like, the planning on that. So you're saying, what, what will it be? Uh, <clears throat> and after, after you've completed the feasibility study, then you have financing to build the mine has to be obtained and construction carried out. And as it's noted here, uh, you know, things often change during the construction stage, but the, the more uh, accurate and the more, the better planning you've done at the study stages back here, the less likely you are to have major surprises in the construction phase. <coughs> uh, so now just go on a bit more detail, the different elements involved in such technical studies like this. Um, here I'm indicating what I term the, the seven E's, which are, uh, not as exhaustive, but there are important considerations during project development. Uh, endowment, we consider first, that means there has to be something actually rock or mineral of commercial interest in the ground before you initiate a project. Then entitlement means if you're going to invest a lot of money in a new project, you want to be sure that you get some benefit from your investment. So a company promoting a project, they need to acquire the ownership or the rights to explore and develop a mine. Uh, evaluation is then when we would collect all the geological data and so forth that we, such as geological mapping, drilling and sampling, uh, so that we can create detailed three-dimensional models of how the geology deposit and where the mineralization of interest, where your gold mineralization is located and to, in order to estimate the tons and grades of the mineralization, which is necessary all for, uh, you know, estimating the value of what you'll be able to extract. Then the engineering stage, that's where you design the mine excavations and the process plant that will be required and, and how you'll move the materials from underground to the surface and process them into a saleable product. And then we have external factors that include uh, meeting the power and water supply requirements as well as access to markets for the mineral products and the prices that you're going to get. Then we have environmental, social and governance or ESG factors. That refers to consideration of the ways in which development of the project would affect the local physical and social environment. And often separate environmental permits are needed as well as mining permits in order to start a new mine. And uh, the Jalas example we just heard about, you saw it was located uh, right next and, and underneath an existing township. So, you know, there'd be concern that what was done in redeveloping that mine was not going to negatively affect the uh, local community. And there's also increasing pressure on mining companies to ensure there's local acceptance for the development of projects and that you take local opinions into account when you're planning project development. And then finally, economic analysis is really the 
key, uh, one of the final steps in a technical study where the capital and operating costs are estimated for project and a financial model is developed to determine whether the project can be developed economically or not. And the results of that analysis would then be used to obtain financing to pay for the new project to be built. And at the bottom of the slide, I've noted then the uh, three important requirements that be needed for a project to proceed. Firstly, there's the necessary permits that includes uh, mining, environmental, and other uh, permits such as water extraction, uh, forestry, and so forth. They need to be obtained in order to allow the project to proceed legally. Uh, secondly, financing needs to be in place so that the uh, so that the co construction of the new mine and the necessary equipment can be paid for. And thirdly, there needs to be ongoing management of risks so as to avoid problems arising that might cause delay or cost overruns or more serious problems that would lead, could lead to the failure of the project. Uh, so say those are, those are all elements that would have to be considered if you were going ahead you know, with developing a mine regardless of what technology you were using for extracting ore. <laughs> And then I just pulled this, there's a lot of text on this, but it's mainly for, uh, you know, future reference uh, for people looking at the presentation. Uh, but this is illustrating the sort of way uh, projects tend to be developed in a staged manner from a concept to initial assessment, prospect testing, then these three study stages, scoping, pre-feasibility, feasibility, and then the construction, production, and uh, uh, closure stages. <coughs> Uh, I've highlighted in green the cells where I think really are, you know, the, the robo miners developing new technology will be considered uh, and then it will require for this project, or at least, I mean, it's mainly focused on the technology, but in order to pilot out the technology, you may be identifying and assessing projects where the new technologies could be tested and potentially implemented. And obviously the initial focus be getting on your, your Robot, uh, robot miners working, but after that you'll have to identify suitable zones where larger scale pilot mining could be uh, carried out. And that would need to be tied in with geological modeling and assessment of the mineralization uh, in order to identify or, and evaluate any key factors that might affect the implementation of the robot mining. <laughs> And then this slide illustrates some of the, I think uh, Jose has already touched on quite a few of these, but it's some of the many factors that would need to be considered when selecting and designing any underground mining method. Uh, the upper photograph here shows an artisanal mine in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where miners are manually lifting bags of, individual bags of ore uh, containing, I think this was probably cobalt uh, type of mineralization out of the mine. Uh, whereas the, the lower photograph shows a, a more mechanized mine with a, a load hole dump truck, LHD type truck, uh, which is used in flatline mineralization in larger uh, mechanized underground mines. Uh, so, you know, those are, if you like, a difference in selectivity. Here he's got a bag of ore. In that case, there's a much larger scoop of, of material is taken in one go. <coughs> But if you look at the factors on the left, all of these would be important, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, what dimensions of opening you have to create and what dimensions of opening are stable to stay open. So the, the rock mass strength and the, the foot wall and hanging wall characteristics, you can see in all, in all of these, you know, the, the individual miners or the equipment have to be in a safe space where they're not going to be continually bombarded by rocks falling on them. And I think even your robot miners would you know, need to avoid being trapped by, a, say, a large block of rock pinning them down underground. <laughs> and again, you know, there may be other aspects such as, well, I, I already illustrated uh, the aspect of acid mine water, but you know, again, the, the amount of water, there may be things such as geothermal gradient and gas as well. And perhaps with, with, with respect to the Kupfer Schieffer, that may be one interesting one, because one of the limitations I understand in Poland for the mining at present is that they're going down deep and the temperatures are getting uh, quite high, which is making it much more difficult for, uh, you know, miners to, to work. And the same happens in South Africa, although they use a lot of refrigeration and everything. But again, uh, that might be one aspect where robotic miners would be able to work in areas which were not um, uh, safe for humans to work. 
And again, this just said summarizing again the study stages, but this is illustrated uh, the way in which the confidence in the estimates of costs uh, increases as you go, go through the study stages with this sort of spread in the y-axis indicate the accuracy range. So here at the scoping study, you've got a, quite a wide range of uncertainty associated with the estimates. And then at the feasibility study, you're trying to get a, a more precise estimate. And uh, these arrows are indicating key decision points in the progress of the project. And so the, the, the most important thing to realize here is that each stage of the project, key risks and uncertainties need to be identified. And then in the next stage, you take action to obtain more information so as to reduce those uncertainties or to change the proposed design so that you avoid any risks having a negative effect on the project. And just finally, for a, for a summary here, uh, this just uh, will show the way in which these different elements need to be taken into account and linked together within an overall project management framework. And as I said, the starting point is the geology and mineralization, your endowment, then you have your entitlement, which may be your, your ownership and your, your permits. Uh, then you have the evaluation and engineering uh, design stages. Uh, then you have external factors such as your uh, social environmental aspects in the market and infrastructure. Uh, then you have the economic analysis and all of that will hopefully lead to the you know, financing and permitting to, to go ahead. Uh, and so I hope that's given you an idea of, you know, some of the elements involved in a typical mining project. Uh, you know, I realize that, uh, well, as uh, Claudia has mentioned, the Robo Miners is really only developing the technology. But if you're thinking ahead to the next phase and, you know, looking for industrial partners to develop the technology, that it's useful to know all the sort of aspects they have to uh, consider and, you know, potentially you're, you're using robotic miners might, you know, in reduce the concerns of social environmental aspects, but again, or, but if not, not properly implemented, it might make it adverse. So, you know, again, you have to consider, is it going to reduce risks or, or uh, you know, minim minimize risks? <clears throat> and so I just put my email up there. I'll, I'll copy it into the uh, chat in a minute, or maybe, maybe some, one of the organizers could just put my email in the chat so that if, if people, uh, want to contact me and don't have a question answered uh, during the course, then, then they can do so. But I'll, I'll stop my share now and we can go to questions. Thank you very much, Ed. Very interesting. And yes, of course, as you mentioned, uh, the technology, as I see also, uh, is a, just a small piece of a very much, or much bigger puzzle. So in RoboMiners, we, we are addressing the technology, but we also are touching some of the points you, you pointed out more than the technology alone. Okay, that was just my comments. So let's get, go to the questions. Um, what types of studies are necessary to know if an, uh, if an, an abandoned mine, such as the one in the example from uh, Jose Mario Branco, can be reopened and exploited by this robot, by this kind of robot? Ah, uh, yeah, well, there'd be, well, I, you know, I think one of the first ones would usually abandoned mines that are being monitored for environmental things. So the first one would be concerns that if you started doing something, say you might end up polluting the river or something because you start, you know, pumping the mine around. And uh, I just know here, I live, I live in Wales uh, where there's been old coal mining. And over the Christmas period, there was a big incident where an old mine had been sealed. And because there was extra rainfall and everything, the the plug on the old mine burst and you know flooded several people's properties. So I think environmental concerns would be a you know one big consideration. Uh, and again, you know, it would be as I say, chatting with the local community as well as to you know what, whether what you were going to do was going to affect them. So I think you know if it's a new technology as well, educating them as to what it would mean. But you, you might have people there who had worked in the old mine who would also be be interested. But you know, so I think that those would be the kind of things that would be slightly different from uh, the other. And, you know, again, if, if the, as I showed in that open pitch, you've had a, <laughs> a lot of water with, with, which is very acidic. And so if you start pumping that around, you, you, you know, you have to see, well, what, A, what will its effect on your equipment be? And B, can you prevent it being released into the environment also? Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you, Ed. Uh, next question. You mentioned Roman's mine in narrow spaces. Was it to minimize the production of waste 
uh, of waste rock, or does this have a big impact on the economic feasibility of, of a mine? Uh, well, I think, I think there's, there's still a bit of debate as to exactly what the Romans were mining originally at Rio Tinto, but uh, certainly some of the stuff they appear to have mined was a very thin layer, uh, which was very rich in silver, and it was a very sort of soft clay layer at the bottom of a very hard rocky layer. So I have seen in the old open pits there, uh, you know, small narrow tunnels which were only a meter or two across and they found the Roman underground lamps in these. So it was more, they knew there was a very rich mineralization in a, in a weak layer. And, you know, they essentially, they would have been sending the miners down, you know, like, like a mole really to, to, to follow along that and, and get the materials out. So it, it, what the Romans were doing were really akin to that photograph I showed of the artisanal miners in, in the Congo. Mm -hmm. in the Congo. So it, 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 it was more, they, they were just going after quite narrow, high grade, mineralization, but of the type really that the robo miners is, is considering. I think they, they did have other mines elsewhere where they did, you know, they use, they were very good at managed water hydraulic engineering, the Romans. And if you, if you are in Spain, I, you see lots of examples of that in Spain and Portugal. And, you know, in some areas they, they use the, the water to mine very low grade ores as well uh, in nor north of Spain, I think. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And a question. Yeah, now I have two questions more specific uh, uh, regarding robotics. So uh, the first one is robo the robot miner concept would change. I mean, would the robot miner concept change uh, your mineral reserve assessment? And if and if yes, in what terms? Uh, yeah, well, definitely. I mean, it would really in the way that Jose uh, Branco was, was illustrating his calculation that the biggest difference would be the selectivity. So you wouldn't have to mine as much waste or that that would, uh, you know, be you to extract higher grade, you'd have less waste material to dispose of as well. And, uh, you know, so I think that that would probably be the big change, as, as he illustrated, if you can, you know, extract, say, one ton of ore on its own rather than one ton of ore and three tons of waste it's obviously going to be much more efficient and you leave you leave the waste material in the ground where it was rather than bringing it up having to crush it and having to dispose of the waste material again so i think the mining selectivity would would be the the really big uh, difference i think mm -hmm. uh, okay so uh, next question about uh, the technologies uh, apparently this robot will extract uh, only small small amounts of ores. In this context, can it ever reach the economic feasibility goals required by investors? Uh -huh. I think we might be better leave this one till after Steve's talk. I mean, I can give I can give a preliminary answer now. But I mean, I I would feel for for me, I think the best chance of starting this off would be uh, in existing mines on the edges where they often have to leave behind material because it's either too narrow or whatever. But if you had robot miners, you could send around the edges of you know, existing mines, then uh, the, the companies might well be interested because if they can get an extra, you know, extra production from the mine before they shut it down, then, then you know, they'd, they'd be able to generate more money. So, so the, I, my, my feeling is that probably your best potential for an industrial development initially is looking at existing underground mines and trying to get more material out that you know, if, if they just stick with their existing technologies will be left behind. And, you know, for, and also like, for instance, South Africa, the deep gold mines of the Witwatersrand, Rand, you know, those are, use a lot of human, human, they're quite human labor intensive. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are a lot of social issues there as well, because they're, they're sort of low, because they, the workers are only paid a low amount, it makes it economic, but you know, they're certainly getting to the point where even with very low paid human labor, they're not going to be economic. And, you know, again, there'd be social advantages having robot robotic miners. But, you know, places like the Coop for Sheeper and the Witzwaters Rand, you know, as I mentioned already, they're getting to depths where the temperatures are, are uncomfortable or unmanageable for humans. And, uh, you know, hopefully, I guess robots would be able to cope with slightly higher temperatures. That's <laughs> <laughs> or that's another another design challenge for you to face. <laughs> yeah, one of the many. Uh, I think that we have 
time for a couple of questions more. Uh, so uh, how can you evaluate or validate the pre-feasibility and feasibility studies assumption for the RoboMiner concept if it is new and there are no comparative terms or reference? This is a good one. Yeah, well, that, that would be the same with, as with a lot of the processing technologies. So what will often happen if it's a kind of new technology or a new extraction method? Usually people will build a, a sort of pilot, do a pilot plant or a pilot scale mining. So you, you, you would essentially set up a small scale trial operation to, to, to prove that the technology worked and to, you know, get a better idea of the costs involved and the, the practical issues. So, you know, so once again, this is why I think it would be most likely to initiate on an existing operating mine because you could then, you know, you'd have, have a lot of the infrastructure already there and you'd just be testing your mining in, in a given sector of the, the mine where they wanted to operate. So, so you, you'd have a kind of pilot study or, you know, prototype, uh, you know, first, you, I guess you'd have your prototype robotic miners and then you would do a pilot mining you know to excavate all of one one area say to, to, to you know to because inevitably once you start trying to put it into practice you'll find there'll be practical aspects and you probably adjust the design in order to get it working and then you know there you may find some things you hadn't thought about at all that you have to then <laughs> adjust in order to to cope with so so that that's the way i'd say it, a sort of pilot a pilot study trial study which would probably come at the scoping study or you know in, er, at, er, much earlier on in the in the the study cycle mm -hmm. thank you okay so i think this is, is going to be the last question then we have to move on it is possible to apply the Crisco modifying factors to a new technology such, such as this one that has never been tested. I think this is related to... to yeah, the... really what I said on the last one, it, it's all to do with risks and uncertainties and a new technology is much more risky and there's more uncertainties. So people would want to see that you've done a pilot study and um, you know, maybe if I make the example of, you know, the vaccines that we're all waiting on, they're doing a lot of trials to check those work properly before they're, they're you know, rolling those out. So in the same way, you know, before an investor would want to put in a lot of money, they'd want you to have a demonstration trial that showed that it would work and that you, you know, you, you would, wouldn't cost, you know, that you had a realistic estimate of the costs involved. Okay. So thank you very much, Ed, for the presentation and for the discussion. Okay. It's time now, it's time now to move on to <clears throat> the last uh, presentation of the day, of the webinar, which is going to be by Stephen Henley. So Stephen Henley is a geologist with both public and private sector experience. He has been working for 10 years with geological surveys in Australia and the UK. And in 1981, he co-founded the Datamine Group, uh, a, which is a market-leading international provider of geological modeling and mine planning software. Since 93, he provides independent consultancy and contract research services. So he has been a member of PERC also, setting standards for research and for standard research, sorry. And uh, He's also very active in research. He's now participating in uh, several EU, proje EU projects, developing robotics application for the mineral industry. And he's currently the president of the International Raw Material Observatory, Observatory the intro. And Steve will talk about the contribution of the robot miners technology to resuming operation in abandoned mine. Steve. Okay, thank you, Claudio, for that introduction. Um, just a, a few more words of introduction. Um, but, uh, I'm a mathematical geologist uh, representing the, the four decoders team. Um, we're software geologists and engineers um, collectively, uh, a mostly UK based participant in the RoboMinus project. Um, now, I've pre recorded my presentation to make sure I keep to time as I've got a tendency to go off script when I'm doing live presentations. Um, and I'll be, I'll be summarizing uh, some of the work of the, the whole consortium, not just our own small part of it. Good afternoon. Ava has introduced the RoboMinus project. Uh, what I plan to do in the next few minutes is to tell you a little more about the project 
and uh, what we've done so far and what we plan to do. The project is a European Horizon 2020 project. Uh, it has partners from 11 European countries and that covers a whole range of different types of organization from uh, geoscientific uh, SMEs, uh, universities, uh, governmental organizations and non-governmental associations. The objective is to develop a bio-inspired modular robotic mining system uh, specifically for small and difficult to access deposits. This would be equipped with selective mining capabilities using a wide range of perception and mining tools and should be capable of being delivered in modules to the deposit uh, via a large diameter borehole if necessary or if through an existing mine uh, through shafts or adits that are already there. And it should be capable of mining not only underground, but also in either dry or flooded environments. Many of the targeted deposits will be abandoned mines in Europe. Um, Robo miners will develop a solution for reopening many of these without the need for full recommissioning of the mine and in particular without the need for dewatering the mine um, because many will already have been flooded uh, maybe to surface. Many abandoned mines are old, uh, sometimes very old. Um, they extracted small ore deposits and they were exploited in the past by manual methods. On the left is a copper mine uh, that was mined in the 18th century. On the right is a lead zinc mine uh, that was operated in the 1950s uh, and only uh, about half a kilometer from where I live. So many of these mines are flooded or otherwise unstable and unsafe for human access. This is an example of the challenges that uh, we might find in uh, flooded underground mines uh, where First of all, we have uh, the depth. Uh, this one is only 100 meters, but they could be uh, many hundreds of meters deep. The timbers are ancient. Uh, in this case, uh, we know that uh, they're at least 160 years old, probably more than that. Uh, and the, uh, the waste rock there is uh, is simply held up by the timbers and uh, we have no idea how safe it is. There are automated mines today, modern mines, uh, but uh, unfortunately mining equipment tends to be big and heavy and unsuitable for reopening old mines in small deposits. So mining machinery is big whether it's for open pit mines or for underground mines. So what we need is equipment that is small for small deposits and also that's remotely controlled or automated for safety so that uh, humans are not exposed to the risks of uh, reopening uh, ancient mines. Mining equipment suppliers are aware of the needs and uh, have done a lot of work on designing new um, machinery. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, most of this uh, is still too big for what we need. There are also a large number of research projects on uh, such things as cutting methods and perception options. What we're looking for in rubber miners is a new approach which uh, takes inspiration from animals, uh, burrowing and crawling animals, uh, and also the mine designs uh, taking inspiration from their feeding patterns. Locomotion of the robot is going to be one of the key factors that we need to incorporate. Uh, there are many conventional options like legs or wheels or tracks. Uh, nature itself uh, provides a, a lot of uh, 
different possibilities from swimming to walking and crawling. And we've analyzed these to find out what the real options are for uh, a robotic system. For example, one that we have looked at in detail is the Archimedes screwdrive. Uh, this is uh, not something that uh, will be familiar to, to many people, but it allows vehicles to operate in a wide variety of different terrains and uh, it allows motion in any direction. Here we've set up a test bed uh, to show how the Archimedes screw operates. It will work well in a wide variety of different uh, materials, uh, sand or gravel. It will also work very well in slurries. So this is a serious option that we should consider. But it's not the only option. Uh, therefore, we've uh, created virtual and physical models to test the different sorts of locomotion that are possible. The robot miner itself will be modular with each module based on the same chassis, the same common functionality. Uh, the main modules will be uh, production. Uh, this will actually break the ore, will do the mining. Uh, then uh, comminution, uh, the crushing and grinding, followed by slurification, uh, which would take the comminuted ore and produce a slurry that can be transported to surface. Then a transport module, which actually contains the slurry pump. And finally, but not least, the uh, control module, uh, which contains the computer, uh, the control unit, and data transfer capabilities. Many different sensors will be needed uh, to sense the geology and the mining environment. Also to provide mapping and localization so the robot knows where it is, to assist in the excavation, and to sense the slurries that are produced. Geophysical and geochemical methods will be needed to assist in ore following, and this shows a couple of examples of the geophysical methods that we might be using. And we're de developing instrumentation in the laboratory uh, that we can test before in integration with the robot miner itself. There are a very wide variety of conventional mining strategies that are used in uh, existing mines. Some of these are suitable for robotic mining, but reopening old mines or even extending currently operating mines could allow us to use other mining strategies when extending into virgin ground um, to exploit new high grade ore bodies, for example. And this is where bio-inspiration comes in again, uh, looking at uh, feeding patterns of worms and other uh, creatures. Uh, these trace fossils on the left uh, show feeding patterns of a particular uh, ancient worm. And uh, this leads to a couple of different uh, mining strategy ideas for extracting the, the maximum of uh, mineral uh, with uh, the least left behind in pillars. An important mine strategy uh, that was developed fairly recently by the IPCON Institute in Moscow is uh, the honeycomb mine, uh, where the honeycomb um, is a load-bearing structure uh, that's used in many composite materials and uh, its advantage is that it will leave 
uh, the minimum necessary amount of ore in pillars and extract the maximum proportion possible. And finally, we need to look at the interaction between the robot design and the mine design. Uh, the robot design itself will have a number of constraints on the capabilities and, and hence on uh, what mine design we can actually adopt. Uh, this example that I'm showing here uh, is the turning radius of the, the robotic system, and that, that will control uh, the design of, of mine layouts, um, how fast you can turn a corner. Well, this was a quick run through the project. Uh, I think um, I've kept the time. Uh, so we should have some time for questions if you have any. So uh, just one comment before the, we get into the questions. Uh, it's nice to see how the bio inspiration comes not only uh, in place uh, when designing the robot, but also when designing the mind. So we have a double double bio inspiration there. Okay, so let's get to, 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 the, <clears throat> to the question. The first one is, would great control sampling be possible with robot miners? Great control sampling. In theory, I see no reason why not. Uh, although the the concept of the robo miners um, is uh, is that uh, they would actually uh, find find the ore by ore following themselves using using their geochemical and geophysical sensors. Um, so grade control will be done um, in real time. Uh, there's no need for advanced grade control sampling. Okay, thank you. And the processing of the ore seem to imply they will be in small quantities. Where would it be done? And are current, current facilities flex, flexible enough to, or not suitable? Okay. Um, there's two stages of ore processing. Um, one is the, the comminution, so that you can actually uh, take the ore out of the mine uh, rather than in, the, in large, uh, large boulders that, uh, that will be produced um, at, the, at the rock face. Uh, so uh, our, our plan A is slurification, basically crushing and grinding um, in the robot system itself and then pumping the slurry to the surface for um, further processing. And that further processing is not really within the scope of the project. Um, in a dry mine, um, an alternative to slurification will be transport of crushed ore uh, to the shaft and lifting it out in a, in a much more conventional way. Okay, thank you. Next question. Uh, now we're getting to, to, to very technical details. So the small size of the miner and the strength of the, of the host rock implies either very low penetration rates and low production or very high tool wear, which implies frequent stoppage for maintenance. How is this reconciled? Okay, uh, I'll take, the, uh, take that in reverse order. First of all, we don't want stoppage for maintenance because uh, the robot is going to be operating in places which are inaccessible to humans. So a stoppage for maintenance implies taking the robot out of the mine to maintain it. Um, we really don't want to do that. Um, so what we're looking at is, uh, is the um, cutting methods that, uh, that minimize um, wear on, uh, on the tools. Um, we've already looked at uh, one or two of these like uh, We've uh, eliminated uh, drilling and blasting in a flooded mine as, as really not practicable. Um, but there are, there are a wide range of other uh, different uh, production methods that we could uh, adopt. Um, things like radial axial splitting and uh, you know, hydro, uh, you know, um, water jets, um, cavitation. There's, there's, Quite a large number of potential ways of, of fragmenting the ore um, and uh, it's going to depend largely on on the rock type that we're working in um, you know one of the uh, key words in the in the uh, rubber miners project is modular 
the robot is going to be modular for a reason uh, because uh, it has to be able to operate in a wide variety of different mine environments. Mm, thank you, Steve. Very good answer. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, uh, of course, it will depend on, on the specific deployment, uh, all, 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 these, all these choices. Um, let's move on. My project is with, uh, with a flooded mine and we have problems with the collapse chambers where the, rob where the robots cannot enter. Can you please describe how are you plan planning to solve this? <laughs> yes, uh, there's a couple of different uh, options there. Um, I, I may be accused of not answering the question, uh, but this, the simple one is you just mine through the uh, collapse. You mine through the, the material that's collapsed into the chamber. Um, but of course, uh, that material could also include infrastructural um, objects, uh, cables and conveyor belts, and uh, you, know, you could have buried trucks and so on. Uh, so uh, that would need a specialized robot to, to actually uh, cut through um, all the, uh, the man-made materials. Uh, to, to give access. Um, I think that's really beyond the scope of the project, unfortunately. Um, so uh, it's, it's a question that we, we can't answer yet, but we have to flag for, for um, further uh, work. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Steve. So the next question I think is more or less the same. Uh, how do you plan to deal with uh, areas having rock stability problems? I think you you just answered to that, right? Well, there is a, yeah, the, there are other answers actually on the rock stability problems, um, and uh, you know we we've uh, so far identified uh, about a dozen different um, potential rock stability problems. Um, it's uh, something that we're working on right now. So I don't have answers to all of them. One that, uh, that I've looked at is, uh, you know, this is one that I, I've looked at myself, is, uh, is the potential risks of water inrush um, if you intersect an aquifer um, or water on a fault plane. Um, and that uh, could be solved potentially uh, by doing pilot drilling ahead of the mining. and. Uh, if you've got a, a small small drill hole and you suddenly find water coming through it, it's a lot easier to plug than uh, than trying to stop the water um, during the mining operation. So we have a lot of questions for Steve, which is I think normal. Do you have already a projected efficacy of the method? Will it reach above ninety percent utilization upon implementation? Ah, this is a research and innovation project. It only goes to uh, TRL four or five. Um, that's the sort of question that uh, I think can't be answered until we come uh, much closer to uh, a commercial project product. Yeah, sure. So yeah, I just remind that this is a research problem, research, yeah. research project, not not industrial project. Any thought uh, with with respect to what the actual continuous mining tool at the rock face might look like. Ah, <laughs> no. <laughs> This, this is a, a matter of, uh, of engineering design. Um, I have to admit, I'm, I'm not an expert in that field. Um, yes, Claudio, your, yourself, you may, you may be able to answer that better than I can. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We are, really, we actually, yeah we actually it's really meeting, one for the engineers. Yes. Uh, we actually had a meeting this very morning about this, <laughs> this topic. And we have been discussing intensively about a couple of concepts. So we are thinking about that. We don't have a, a, def, a defined concept, uh, a defined design yet. We have two or three ideas that we are kind of uh, exploring more. Yeah, I, th I think again, it, it's something that uh, that will really be dependent on the rock type. Yes. Uh, if you have a soft rock, it's it's much easier just to cut it with a with a simple um, tool, uh, such as used in the, in long wall coal mining. Um, if, it, if it's hard rock, then you need to fragment the rock before you can extract it. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is a, a, a good question regarding your background. So as you can see in the photo behind Steven, don't you think it is possible to drill with small machine only the straight and continuous line of mineralization, leaving in place the surrounding rock mass and 
the waste that could be cemented as you advance? <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah, that, that uh, <laughs> yeah, the background um, is actually calcite veins in a limestone. So the, the material in the veins and the, and the rock are actually chemically and, and physically very similar. <laughs> Um, so drilling in a straight line is not going to be a problem in that. <laughs> um, more generally, though, uh, yes, dr drilling in a straight line is a problem. Um, you know, if we're looking at long pilot holes, uh, then uh, that's something that we need to address. But there is a, an enormous amount of drilling technology already developed that, uh, that we can plug into. Mm -hmm. So, uh, thank you. Uh, next question. Is the robot size critical from uh, an economical perspective? <laughs> Again, um, it's a research project. We're not looking at the economics, um, except that uh, in terms of the, um, the, the deposit size that we're looking at, we're looking at small deposits. Um, therefore, um, we don't want big robots. Uh, you know, a big robot trying to extract a, a one meter or a half meter thick vein is going to take out a lot of waste. And, uh, and the whole purpose of, of Robo Miner's project is to minimize the amount of waste that we, uh, we take. Um, as Jose was, uh, was saying uh, about the, uh, the gold mine in Portugal, that uh, uh, they, they may have 25 centimetre veins. Um, if we can take out 50 centimetres with the robot, that's, the, that's already 50% of waste. Um, if we've got a robot which is, which is two metres wide, that, that's um, a lot of waste. Sure. So the smaller the robot, the smaller the deposit we can work on. Sure. Excellent. Uh, maybe may robo miners be applied to stock works? Why not? <laughs> yeah, no reason why not. Wonderful. So we have a couple of. Ah, I, I could add to that actually uh, that uh, it's one of the advantages of the honeycomb um, mine layout that uh, it's very flexible in terms of the, the the size and shape of the deposit that it can extract. So a honeycomb mine layout design might be the best way of, of approaching a stock work. Okay, so I think this, we have time for, for one more question. Uh, a couple of, uh, okay, a couple of questions. Other than grinding, uh, which will be the difficult to overcome regarding tool wear? Have you explored much as acid digestion methods? I don't think so. Uh, but thanks for the suggestion, and it's something we'll look at. <laughs> yes, I was thinking about the same. Yeah, <laughs> we will we, we'll, we'll take that into account. Yeah. Okay. So uh, <laughs> I, I kept the, the last question. Uh, this question to be the last one because I think it can can be useful to summarize the the, the whole webinar actually. So the question is, how far we are away realistically before this could be a reality? Okay, the, the, the time horizon we're looking at um, for this to be actually deployed is in the range of 2030 to 2050. So we're looking 10 to 30 years ahead. Um, we may have uh, demonstration systems before then, uh, but for, for sort of full scale industrial application, we're looking quite a long way ahead into the future. Sure. Uh, actually, one, uh, just, let me just add that one of the activity of the project, one of the outcomes of the project is also a roadmap for the next uh, uh, 10 to 20 to 50 years, uh, until 2050, actually, I think I remember. Uh, so, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, the very last question that just, uh, just entered, uh, this, somebody's asking uh, to explain briefly how the robot works in general. <laughs> it's a difficult one. 
I'm a geologist, not an engineer. <laughs> uh, how the robot works. Okay, very, very simply, um, the way that we're looking at it at the moment, it's uh, likely for the foreseeable future um, to be uh, tethered, uh, to operate um, under under human control from from a control room at the surface um, power in the robot um, it will have onboard batteries but probably an external power supply again from the surface uh, at least to recharge the batteries um, you know mining is a, is a, an energy intensive activity um, so uh, you know, to rely totally on batteries is, is really not practicable at the moment. Um, we're looking at um, hydraulic uh, transmission of, of power within the robot systems, um, uh, looking specifically uh, at water hydraulics, um, which have some advantages over conventional hydraulic oil. Um, Again, I'm not an engineer, so I can't answer specific questions about that. Um, what else? Um, how will it operate? Uh, locomotion, uh, as I said, we're looking at the Archimedes screwdrive, uh, but that's not the only possible locomotion method. And again, it may well depend on the particular mining environment, which solution is best. Uh, so uh, the robot is going to be designed so that uh, we can uh, we can try alternative solutions. Mm -hmm. Clarity again. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, let me add uh, that as you mentioned, this is a research project, so we are exploring different uh, alternatives. So the purpose is not just to, to design one robot that which we will do, but also to explore different uh, different ways. And uh, something more about the functioning of the robot. Of course, the robot will be capable of uh, let's say smelling where the the ore is. So per, so we are working on perception. So it should it should be it will be able to detect in some way uh, where to dig autonomously, and then of course digging it. So that's a very big that's a very important part of the project. Um, okay, so I think that's that's more than enough. We are right on time. Well, let me check just one like, last check. Last question, what, what would be the wet water ratio in percentage to be inflowed to, the, to assure the continuous mining et extraction with the robot? How would, oh, sorry, I don't understand the question. Okay, yeah, I, I can see it on my screen, that question. Ah, sorry. Yeah. Um, it would need quite a lot of water flow. Um, uh, as percentages, I, I, I couldn't uh, say, but... Uh, you know, we, we have um, in, in the project, we have experts on, on slurries. Um, so they, they would know what the minimum amount of water required is. Um, but certainly we would be planning that, uh, that this would be a closed cycle so that uh, any water used in the, in the slurry transport would be recycled. Um, in a flooded mine, of course, we can we can also take the mine water itself uh, where where we need extra water. Okay, so uh, thank you very right, much. Looking, yeah, uh, I think it's it's uh, it's more than enough for the moment. Uh, I would like to ask all the panelists to 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 join to turn on the cameras. We can have a final round of questions in case. There was there are some question for Jose, Eva, or or Ed. Any any question for the previous panelists? Can I ask Steve a question? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> just just to, to put you on the spot. No, I just wondered what are the challenges from the software? You know, because your background is software, and from the software control systems, what are the main kind of challenges in terms of programming those? Okay, the, the big challenge for, for um, our own part of the, the team is, is going to be real-time updating of the geological model uh, with data coming in um, across the board from a, from a range of geochemical and geophysical sensors 
actually integrating that into a continuously updated um, 3D or 4D model um, is, uh, is going to be a real challenge. Um, it's where we will need um, artificial intelligence methods, deep learning methods. Um, and we've started work on some of this. Um, we've, uh, we've done uh, some, uh, some work on the, on the deep learning algorithms that, that we're going to need. Okay. Yeah. Uh, why do we need that in real time? Because the idea is that the robot will be able to follow the ore. I, uh, I don't see uh, any more questions. We have, uh, we have had uh, quite a few of them, which is good. So the, semi the webinar has come to, to its end. I would like to thank again all the attendees uh, for the enthusiastic response. We have had almost uh, more than 150 registered participants, of which Approximately 100 was online during the talk, uh, so which is a very good result. So I would like to thank, of course, the panelists. Thank you, Eva, jo Jose, Ed, and Steve. And also thank to the organizers, which are uh, EFG, Vitor, Maria, Anita, and Alberto. I hope I don't forget anybody. Keep following us on the social media and on the web page. Otherwise, thank you everybody for participating, for to all the panelists and the attendees and the organization and have a nice day.